Okay, so we're live now, and um, you have the floor. Oh man, pressure. Um, so this is uh, X Essentials Power Injection Made Easy. Um, I promised Ed I'd, I'd use the template, and so here's a shot of the template. Um, I didn't promise I'd use it the entire presentation, so uh, oh, I'm gonna click over here. Is it working? There it goes. Uh, so I didn't use PowerPoint. I had a I had a famous motivational speaker once tell me that the thing about PowerPoint is people who use it typically don't have power or a point. Um, so this is power injection. I thought I'd be doing something a little different. This is actually a display of my house. Uh, this was this past year. I have, um, I think 4,000 something pixels. I lost the final count and I remember. And I use a, a, a couple F4s and that's all I use for my display. Um, tonight, I, oh, let me, that's, I guess that's going the order. So who am I? I'm an electrical engineer for the US Navy. Uh, specializing in robots and embedded systems. Um, I bought my first house in 2014. Uh, we did our first light show in 2015. Uh, I was two years Vixen, and this past year was my first year converting to X lights. Um, so it only makes me about three years established uh, in this hobby, though I've always kind of been about lights. And to prove that, this is actually a wedding picture from our wedding in 2012. Uh, yes, both my wife's dress and my suit were hacked and had lights in them. Both of them actually had embedded Vixen 2 sequences programmed into them because uh, they did little animations during our wedding. Um, we also had a 3D printer as a guest. This is back in 2012, so this is a little older. Um, and our wedding invitations even had LEDs in them that had a little uh, show in the LEDs and there was even an Easter egg that did Morse code. Uh, bottom line, I've always kind of been someone who does LED. Um, I'm, I got on Reddit's front page one day for the tie I'm wearing in this picture because it plays Tetris using pixels. Um, I was at a science convention in Washington, D.C. for this picture, and it was actually kind of fun because the photo op astronaut stopped me for a picture, which I thought was a nice uh, reverse uh, role there. Uh, so why are we here? Well, it's power injection. Uh, being an electrical engineer and designing all sorts of stuff involving power, you know, you think power injection hard, is hard, try designing a one and a half kilowatt power board for an ROV that has to fit in the size of a book. I mean, that's hard. That's the kind of things I do at work. Power injection is not hard, and I promise you I will convince you of this by the end of, the, end of this presentation. Uh, so let's jump into it. We got to go through some background first so that I can effectively uh, convey uh, this system to you. First, I need everyone to get really close to their screens. Like, get really, really close. Is everyone close? Perfect. Because I need you to forget everything. Uh, and this is kind of my point. Power injection is not hard. People make it hard. And if you want to see what I mean, just look for power injection in the X Lights Facebook group, and you'll start to look like this guy, uh, feeling the weight of a million results, all with different answers. Um, the, the reason it's so hard when you look for answers on power injection is because there's many ways to do it. There's many right ways to do it. There are many wrong ways to do it. And people get, from what I see, people get confused trying to follow several different ways and rules. Uh, so tonight, I'm going to focus on my way. It's not the way. It's, it's not saying everyone else's way is wrong. It's just my way. And I believe my way will be very effective for people if they stick to it. And the, and the reason I say that is because my, the way I'm gonna teach you tonight is about being successful. It's about not spending time dealing with problems because you push the limits too far. You know, you see a lot of people post on Facebook that they use 600 lights on one string at 10% power and you can't use white and there you go, I don't need power injection, but that's not a way to be successful. That's a way to push the limits. And when you, when you push the limits, you're putting yourself up to failure. So if you follow my system tonight, it's gonna be a way to be successful, not necessarily 100%, uh, pushing the line or getting something done with a minimum effort. It's, a, it's about being successful because uh, I want to get my props built and I want to put them out in the yard and I want them to work. I don't want to have to debug them. And the reason uh, I'm not going to, and I'm also not really teaching the science behind it because there's a lot of factors that cover um, that are, are influence you being successful when it comes to power injection. You, depending on the wire gauge, the wire length, the composition of the wire, is it copper or aluminum, the impedance, the connector impedance, the environment EFI. There's just so many different aspects about what influences being successful. I couldn't to do it to, I couldn't teach you all this in an hour. So I'm not teaching you the science behind power injection. I'm teaching you a couple tools you can put in your mental toolbox to be able to design props successfully 
and not and have the little chance of failure, a little chance of issues like pink pixels or flickering pixels. So we need to start, we need to standardize some terminology for this to work. So what is power injection? I'm gonna set the definition as power injection is any time power enters a line of pixels separate from the source of the data. So if you look at this picture, when you have just a string of pixels coming off a pixel controller, that's not power injection. If you just move one wire and, and for example, move the red wire to the middle of the string of pixels, that's power injection because now the wires follow different paths. Check and scroll out of here. Oh, I broke it. So power injection is any time power enters a line of pixels separate from the source of the data. And this can be done from multiple points or one point. So next term. Power injection run. This is the length of wire that comes from your enclosure or power supply that runs parallel or alongside your string of pixels until it gets to what we're going to call the power injection point, where you go from this run to the actual string of pixels. So in this picture, there's actually one run with two power injection points. Here we have one run with one power injection point. So we're, we're defining our basic terms here. Power injection, power injection run, power injection point. Why do we do power injection? You're combating voltage drop. Basically, the idea is due to resistance and current, the further down a string of pixels you go, the lower the volts will drop. So if you don't quite understand this graph, that's OK, because here's another picture. Basically, what we're saying is if you measure volts at the beginning of the pixel string and you measure volts at the end of the pixel string, you'll measure what's called voltage drop. That's what we're combating. If the voltage becomes too low, we have issues with our pixels. So what we're doing with power injection is we're distributing the current, or power, distributing the current across multiple wires, additional wires. By, by reducing the current in the wire, we show less voltage drop. That's as far as I'm going to go into the science of power injection. That's just to give people a basic idea of what we're combating here. Quick note on selecting voltage. Oh, this always is what starts the, uh, the, the flame wars on any sort of forum or Facebook group. Why do we have two voltages? And, this, and, this, and everything you're going to learn here in a second only applies to 12 millimeter nodes. The strips and the other form factors don't quite follow these rules because there's different aspects of their design. But with 12 millimeter, 12 millimeter nodes, they all follow these basic principles. 12 volt allows for more voltage drop before affecting color and brightness. It's a trade-off. So yes, you get to inject less. You can go further, but you do pay a cost. The cost is 12 volt pixels draw twice as much power as five volts at the brightness setting. That's why we have two voltages. If one was a perfect voltage, we all would have stuck to it and they wouldn't be sold at two different voltages. But the reason we sell two different voltages is because there's a trade-off and it gives you the option to make a decision on what, on what, what you're prioritizing. I understand a lot, of books, a lot of people respond with electricity is cheap, uh, but power supplies and enclosures are not, depending on the scale of your display. So for example, a 350 watt 12 volt supply with 30% brightness pixels, you can put about 1500 pixels on that power supply before you start to risk problems. Same, pix same brightness on a five volt supply at the same power rating, you can almost, you go more than double the amount of pixels on that power supply. So this is the trade-off. We'll, we'll see more examples of this later on because two of my examples show the benefits of, of, of either and, and talk about the difference it makes in your design. If you want my recommendation as an engineer, I use both. Every single one of my enclosures in my display has both a 12 volt supply and a five volt supply. Most of my display is five volt because a lot of my display like my grids or my Christmas trees are very dense props and I, I keep five volts on those. But anytime I'm doing outlines of my house or I'm doing snowflakes that go up into the sky, I stick to 12 volts because then the advantage goes to 12 volts for the, the reduced number of power injection points and wire for the design. But really, some people would like to stick to one voltage, and everyone can do that fine. So you do you. Both voltages will make lights blink. There's no point in arguing over it. Um, they will, you will see some differences later on in the presentation about which the different parts of the volts um, for your display. And let's talk about how it's physically executed. How, what does power injection mean physically? I'm only brushing this because things we do agree on and things you'll find help with is pretty easy. It's just how to splice wire together because that's really all power injection is, is splicing wire together. That's not the hard part. We'll get to the hard part in a few minutes, but I just want to cover how you actually splice wire together for anyone who's really new to this. 
Obviously, the one that's the, a lot of people uh, think about is you just twist the wires together, you solder them, and then you use a heat gun, you put shrink wrap over them. That's one way to splice wires together. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of going to show a couple different pictures of a couple of different ways, and then you see at the bottom uh, the tools required for the different steps of those ways. So, for example, here you had to uh, solder the wires together, and that's a picture of a soldering iron, and then you use a heat gun to shrink this, the shrink tube over the solder joint just so it's not exposed. I love these. This is the next step up from, from soldering and, and using heat shrink. These are called solder shrink tubes. It's basically a heat shrink tube that has solder in it already, so you don't need the iron anymore. Basically, you just strip your wires, you shove your wires into the tube, and you use a heat gun to both solder and shrink the tube at the same time. I've used these for two years. I've gone through like three, two or three bags of 100 of them. I love them. I'd still be soldering some of the stuff on my display if it wasn't for some of these things. I will put a caveat to this. I, you know, the people that tell you they don't like it, I've usually found there's, there's a couple different reasons why they might not like it. Um, either they're, very, they're a seasoned engineer that has been using shrink tubes forever, and they're still trying to treat these like normal shrink tubes, which you can't, because you can't baby these. You have to give them a lot of heat and not worry about them burning up for them to work correctly. The other people I, I talk to that have issues with these are usually using the butane torches, and I don't recommend butane torches on these. I recommend what is in the picture, which is an actual electric heat gun. Uh, butane torches are just too easy to get a little bit too close and burn a hole in these sleeves. But if anyone's interested, I really suggest looking into these. They're amazing for you know taking a minute to, to create a power injection point, uh, even out in the yard in the cold with the heat gun, and that's it. Of course, other people like to use uh, crimp and shrink tubes. So now we're changing out our soldering iron for a crimper. So these are, I, I grew up calling them butt splices. I don't think anyone calls them butt splices anymore. Uh, but basically you crimp them, you stick two wires in, you crimp it, and then you shrink, you shrink it to make it a watertight connection. That's another way to do it. Uh, and of course, if everyone that wants to use nothing but their hands, depending on your, your vendor, you, they probably sell what's called power injection tees. These are simple plug-in connections that um, allow you to inject power on your pixel strings without doing any splicing. These are fine, they work great. Uh, the only reason I don't use them is they, they kind of limit your flexibility. So if you only have pixels that are in 50 count strings, you know, the, the only place you could power inject is every 50 pixels because you have to wait until you get to a connector. So I don't use these just for those reasons, but if anyone's scared of any other method or tools, this is optional an option. A lot of your vendors will sell what's called power injection tees. And then you need nothing more than your hand to install them. So that's all the methods of physically executing power injection. If you want to know more about those, that's something you can usually Google and find good information on. It's not as uh, uh, convoluted or it's not, there's not enough, there's not a lot of disagreements on how you power inject. The, the disagreements are on some of the stuff we'll get to in a minute. But before we go to anything in power injection, we have to get talk about safety because safety comes first. And what I mean is protection. And protection for us is fuses. When you're setting up the wiring in your display, and when you're considering power injection, you also have to consider fusing. They kind of go hand in hand. One's going to drive the other. So we're going to talk about fusing for a moment. And I want to, I want to be clear about what fusing is, because I don't see this mentioned a lot. Fusing is protecting the wire, not the load. So you don't consider the load when you size fuses. You're considering the wire you're connecting to the fuse. And the whole point of that, oh, I think I put this out of order. I might have. And the whole point of that is we don't want our wires to be the fuse. So we always size fuses based on our wire, not our load. Where do we put our fuse in our design? This question comes up a lot. People talk about, do I need a fuse between my power supply and my controller? And the answer is no. All our power supplies have some form of uh, overcurrent protection or short, short circuit protection built into that. That built-in protection protects the wire inside the enclosure that goes between the power supply and the, the um, pixel controller. The only, where we use fuses is whenever the wire leaves our enclosure, that, that wire should have a fuse on it. So in this picture on my right, which is one of my control boxes, you see my fuse block on the right, and that protects all my power injection points coming out of my enclosure. But you notice in the wire that runs to the left that goes to my Falcon F4V3, there's no fuse on that because it doesn't need to be. Just make sure you use good size wire. You need to use 14 to 10 gauge wire between your power supply and your pixel controller. That's to make sure that the wire itself is not the weakest link should a fault develop, that the, that the power supply will detect the fault and shut down. You may notice on this, on this controller that two of my power injection runs don't have fuses, and that's actually because I'm counting on the built-in protection 
on that smaller power supply to protect the power injection runs as well. And I get to do that uh, using some rules we're going to talk about in a couple seconds. And one note, you can have one fuse protect multiple power injection runs. So instead of having one fuse per wire like I do in this picture, you are allowed to have one fuse then splits to multiple wires depending on how many pixels you have at the end. And here's a, here's a, 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 by the way, I'm terrible at drawings, so I use paint. Don't shoot me, please. Uh, but these are here's some paint drawings of some uh, wire schematics for what I'm talking about. In this case, you see I have one fuse on the left there that is now, that then the wire splits after the fuse to create multiple runs for the slotted pixel. That's allowed. And here's the slot I was looking for. Because we select the fuse by the size of the wire, not the load. Fuse size is determined by a smallest gauge wire after the fuse, and that's so that the wire itself doesn't become the fuse and burn up first. We want the fuse to always be the weakest link. So right off the bat, let's talk about how we select fuse sizes. The, the smallest wire in our pixel display is always going to be our pixel wire, because we shouldn't be using anything smaller than 18 gauge to do our power injection run. So fusing should actually be decided by the gauge wire you use in your pixels. There's a range here. There's a lot of disagreements that people have about is 18 gauge pixels really 18 gauge pixels. Um, there's a lot of issues with how the Chinese wire sizes um, convert to the American wire sizes. And so they tend to run, want to round up because it makes them sound better when they really should be rounding down. Um, I always recommend buying the best size gauge pixels you can because even though we're, there's a lot of evidence that shows it's not truly 18 or 20 gauge, uh, I think everyone has shown that when you buy 18 gauge, you're definitely getting something bigger than when you're buying 20 gauge. So these are ranges depending on when you, if you want to play it safe or be a little more liberal. Uh, basically for 18 gauge pixels, you should have a 10 to a 15 amp fuse. 20 gauge pixels, you should have a 7 to 10 amp fuse. And 22 gauge pixels, you should have a 3 to 5 amp fuse. And I also recommend buying good fuses. I've had some feedback of people telling me that they bought fuses off eBay and there's no way in heck that they're appropriately sized for what they claim to be rated. So I'd recommend getting good fuses from a good uh, vendor and not buying them on eBay. Um, and you may note that, uh, you know, we, there is 22 is kind of the smallest pixels you can buy and that five amps kind of the size fuse you get in most of the power distribution boards out there. And that's and the reason is, uh, there's actually a couple different reasons we'll talk about in a second. But one of them is, you know, they have to account for what the weakest possible pixel is that a customer will connect to their power board. So that's why a lot of people stick to five amps. Um, <clears throat> once you've set your fuse based on the gauge wire of your pixels, you can then play with the brightness on your pixels to be able to put more pixels behind the fuse. And I promise this is the only equation you're going to learn tonight. And this is the equation to figure out how many pixels you can put behind a fuse in your wiring scheme. It's based on the brightness times the pixel current, which is 0 0.055. That's kind of a, um, a standard current value for the, bright, uh, the per pixel current. So this number does not change. The only number that changes is what you're multiplying it with for brightness. So and here's an example. A 15 amp fuse for pixels running at 50% brightness, you can put 545 pixels behind that fuse. If we drop it down, if we're talking about like a 5 amp fuse, but we're going to turn our pixels down to 30%, we can run 300 pixels. So this is the only equation you didn't know, and it's the equation to appropriately count the number of pixels you can put behind the fuse. If you want to put more pixels behind a string, you need to break it up into multiple sections with multiple fuses, and we'll talk about that in a second. A note on distro boards. You know, this is a, this is a Crockett Fantasy of Lights uh, distro board. Many people sell, many, there's a lot of the vendors sell their own versions of these distro boards. I don't recommend trying to increase the value of the fuse on these boards. You'll notice everyone set, tends to stick to 5 amps. These are all 5 amp fuses. There could be other reasons why they, they pick a 5 amp fuse. I believe in, in this case, the connectors are only rated for 7 amps. So you don't want to be putting a 10 amp fuse on a power distro board that has connectors rated for 7 amps because your fuse is no longer the weakest link. You always want the fuse to be the weakest link. If you do want to go bigger like I do in the picture you saw on my controllers, I tend to like these marine fuse blocks because they're rated for 30 or 50 amps per circuit, I believe. Um, so I, I, you know, if, you, if you do want to go bigger, these are perfectly fine. It, it just limits you to 5 amps. If you do want to do something bigger, you can look at automotive or marine fuse blocks, and that's what I use in my display. OK, we've gotten through safety. We've, been, we've talked about some terminology. I think we're ready to dive right in. And we're going to dive right into the rules to live by. These rules are going to be the guidelines for how we're going to uh, wire some prop examples in a second. So these are um, 
these are the different tools you're going to put in your toolbox for figuring out where you need to power inject. First rule, always power inject both the V or the positive in the ground or the negative wires at every point. So the picture I showed you earlier, I'm actually going to say that's wrong now. You need to move both wires to the middle of the string. This is just a balancing issue. You want to make sure current is a complete circuit. Power doesn't just come from positive wire and go away. It actually flows back to the negative wire. So to make sure you don't have any issues, you always want to make sure that you power inject both positive and negative um, along your string. So here I'm saying don't do the first picture, but do the second one. Make sure both positive and negative are injected at every point you end up doing power injection. Second rule, always start at the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to update my picture again. Now what I'm saying is the first picture is not correct. I'm going to split my uh, power injection to two runs. Always make sure you start a string with a power injection point. This is an issue with data. This prevents flickering. A lot of people don't, if you, you'll have issues if you don't at least make sure ground is coming from the beginning of the string from your controller. And if you're going to follow the first rule, you're going to have to have put positive there too. So that's the second rule. Always start with the beginning of the string. Third rule, we're going to go back to our childhood days and count. And here's where the 12 volt has the advantage because it is a bigger number. And I want you to closely pay attention to my terminology here because this is where a lot of people get hung up and asking for advice as well. For five volts, count no more than 50 pixels to any point of power. For 12 volts, count no more than 100 pixels to any point of power. Now notice how I'm wording that. No more than 50 pixels to any point of power. And the reason I'm being careful about this is the next slide. Much like you can, how they say the nearest exit on a plane may be behind your seat, you can count pixels both up and down the string. So this example is a five volt string and the rule we're following is no more than 50 pixels from any point of power. What that means is we're actually gonna inject 100 pixels in because if you pick a pixel anywhere along that first 100, you can go either way to count to make sure it's not more than 50 to 100. Uh, and in, so this is actually an ideal case for how you do power injection. The, the most ideal point is kind of two thirds the way down the string because that gives an even number of uh, number of pixels to a point of power. So count to the nearest point of power both ways. Now we're going to talk about some safety aspects. Um, this is good practice. I'm not going to go into a lot of the, the science behind them. I just recommend that if you want to be safe, just go ahead and follow these rules. I mean, we're just talking about cutting the wire here. And the first rule is isolate between power supplies. So in this picture, you notice I have two power supplies providing power for the string of pixels. I've cut a little white uh, along my positive line because that's the only that's the only wire you need to cut along positive. I've cut into my pixel string a bit to isolate both power supplies. It's a feedback issue. It has to do with the feedback um, circuitry in your power supplies. It doesn't, I don't think we've actually had anyone experience the issues by not doing this, but it's just a good practice. And there's another reason for this, and it's the next slide. Oh, okay, okay, I'm gonna just gonna jump around a bit. You need to cut between fused fuses anyway, because if you've sized your wire for the fuse that has, or if you sized your fuse for the wire along your pixel string, but you haven't isolated those two zones, that means the fuse is no longer the weakest link because both fuses add up. You could draw twice as many, twice as much current through both through your pixel string than you were accounting for if you didn't cut the wire. It's the same reason you wire your house as different circuits for each room. You don't want to go and have the rooms bridge together because now instead of popping your breaker at 15 amps, you'd be popping your breaker at 30 amps. And you don't want that to happen. So since we're going to be good boys and girls and fuse after our power supplies, we also, the cutting of the wire is also for protection of, of blowing your fuse. So there's two reasons for it. Now, um, someone caught me one day when I was giving this presentation and said, wait a minute, Bill, did that mean you're violating your beginning of the string rule? And I, and I said, oh, that's a good point. So we're gonna, we're gonna update the always inject at the beginning of the string rule. We're gonna say always start by powering at the beginning of the string with respect to the ground or negative wire. So we go back and look at our example. Notice the ground isn't cut. It's continuous for the entire length of the pixel line. So we're not, where we cut there the positive wire, that's not the beginning of the string with respect to ground. That's halfway through the string. So we're updating this rule to say, always inject at the beginning with respect to the ground or negative wire. And that hopefully solves the problem that people thought that this might be the start of another string. 
For just to help prevent some issues, I recommend using good power injection cable. I live in Florida. We have to deal with sun rot like crazy. Um, I have pixels that are after three seasons are already starting to just disintegrate in my hands. I love landscape cable because it's UV stable. I've had landscape cable out laying on the ground all year round and it never degrades. It is 14 gauge, it's real copper. It's really 14 gauge. You buy it from Lowe's or Home Depot or Amazon. I get 100 foot rolls for $40 on Amazon. I love it. And it just helps you by having a, a, a bigger cable for power injection. So I recommend using good power injection cable. I also started using these, these uh, knockoff automotive power connectors. I can't believe the pricing on them because they're only a dollar per pair. You buy them 10 for $10. Um, and they're great. They, they're, they're rated for 14 gauge. They can, I've actually put 90 amps through one just to test to see if it could handle it. And it did with flying colors. Uh, I don't know why we have such good value on them. Maybe because they're just Chinese knockoffs, but I recommend those power connectors. I've used them for uh, two shows now and they work great. And last rule, because I want to make sure we have some limits on how many pixels we put at the end of a run. Because uh, we could technically follow a bunch of the other rules and end up with 500 pixels on one 14 gauge power injection run, and I don't want to allow that. So we're going to put some global, no matter what the voltage is, limits on how many pixels you put on one run. And that's based on the wire gauge you use for the, the, the power injection run itself. Um, I, the rules I'm going to set is 350 pixels for 14 gauge, 250 pixels for 16 gauge, 150 pixels for 18 gauge. So what do I mean here? If you look at the wiring on the right, I'm saying if we have a 500 pixel grid, even if it's so close and really easy to wire all together on one power injection run, we shouldn't. We should break it up into two power injection runs or two little mini grids with less pixels. So a 500 pixel grid, which is not really 500 pixels in my picture, but we, we can use our imaginations. Uh, I wanted to say that 500 is too many. You should split that up into two, at least two runs if you're using 14 or 16 gauge, or three runs or four runs if you're using 18 gauge. So we're just establishing some global limits on how many pixels we put at the end of our power injection run. Okay, too much, too fast, hopefully not. Let's jump into some examples because I'm sure you guys are itching to hear some examples. So the way I'm going to teach these examples is I'm going to teach, now that you understand some of the rules or understand or have some tools to approach power injection. I want you to hold on to them, but I want you to always focus on what works with the model. Keep it stupid simple. What in the model makes sense to do wiring? Take a step back, look at the big picture of your model, your layout, and your wiring options. Use the rules as a guideline, not a hard standard. Let's do our first example. If you saw in my, in my bigger picture, I have four of these little mini trees. This is only showing two of them, but I have four of them in my show. How am I gonna wire them? Let's, take, let's talk about what the model itself. Each tree is 70 pixels. There's 50 in the tree and 20 in the star. All my pixels came without connectors, so I have to solder things together anyway. I'll have to solder a string of 50 to a string of 20 just to make a, a 70 pixel string to put in each tree. I'd like to run all these off one port of my controller, which means all four wired together will be a string of 280 pixels total spread out across my yard. And I've, I'm using five volts, and I'm going to set them at 40% brightness. I got 40% from just some experiments in my lab. I put it out in the yard. I went, these are kind of bright. I'm going to reduce them down to 40%. So how do we approach the problem now? So here's what I did. Since I have to solder the 50 to the 20 anyway, I threw a connector in that solder joint. So instead of soldering two wires together, I'm just soldering three, but I don't have to cut wires anywhere else. So in each one of my trees where I made the connection between the 50 and the 20, I went ahead and added this little trailer connector as well. So here's one of my trees. All three, all four look like this. You can see the green wire in the bottom. That's my three core uh, pixel and power in. You can see the power injection plug, which is the little trailer connector hanging from the top. And you can see my three core or three pin pixel and power connector out to the next tree. So what does it look like when you step back and wire it to your control box? Here in this picture, the green represents my three core pixel and power cable that comes right off the port of my controller. The red represents my power injection runs. So for these four little trees, I have four power injection runs. These are a lot less, if you go back to our rules about how many pixels per wire gauge, I actually select a smaller wire. I use 16 gauge speaker wire here. 
if you actually break this down, let's make sure we followed our rules. So basically this means I have power going to pixel one, pixel 50, pixel 120, pixel 190, and pixel 260. That's no more than 70 between power points, which is no more than 35 from the nearest point of power. So I'm well within a comfort zone for following the, the counting rule. 280 pixels at 40% power, that's a 7 amp draw using the equation we, I looked at, we looked at earlier. So I stuck a 10 amp fuse in there. Um, they're 18 gauge pixels, so that's well within uh, the rules for sizing fusing for, for the, the pixel wire size. And I, I fused all four power injection runs with one fuse. So that way I wouldn't have to worry about cutting wire along the pixel strip. So you can see in this control box, there's my one fuse. It's one of those inline trailer connectors. It goes to a little uh, uh, electrical block that's just something that just distributes power across multiple wires. And then you can see my four power injection connectors coming off that and going outside my enclosure. Let's compare had I done this with 12 volt. Well, what's the trade-off this time? The trade-off this time is I would have saved about 15 feet of wire because I will, only would have had to inject in two places instead of four. I could have skipped injecting two of the trees and still and just injected the other two. So using 12 volts would have saved me about 15 feet of wire. But the trade-off was how much of my power supply did it consume? It, the 12 volts uses 55 watts more. So now for a 350 watt supply, I'm using a quarter of it if I'm using 12 volts. I'm only using a tenth of it if I'm using five volts. You know, I'm trying to convince the neighbor to allow, allow me to expand in his yard. I'd like to put two more arches in, another pixel pole, two more pixel poles, and some more trees. So I went with five volts just to give me the upgrade capability without needing to add more enclosures. So if I wanted to expand my front line with two more arches, another pick, two more pixel poles, and two more trees, I'd have no problem doing it because I stuck to five volts mostly. If I was using 12 volts, I might have to start thinking about putting a second enclosure down. That's the trade-off. People don't like to wire, go forth and use 12 volts. You will be happy. I like the ability to add stuff without having to put more controllers in my yard, and I can go forward and do that and be happy. Completely up to you. OK, that's our first example. Who's ready to take a test now? Anyone, anyone volunteer to take a test? OK, I guess it'll be open, Professor. How about this? Uh, spider web. I love this spider web um, for showing uh, power injection. This is from uh, Boiscoya Studios. Um, it's 324 pixels. It's that kind of pretty dense. It's, it presents a real power problem because there's a lot of pixels in a small area, but also presents a good example of how critical thinking with your model can, can save you big time. Let's look at the X-Lights wiring model. So I went into X-Lights, I got the official model from Boiscoyo, I converted to wiring view and printed it out. And here's how X-Lights expects me to wire this model. If we solely went by the rules, oh, give me a second to get some water. If we went solely by the rules, our power injection points would be pixel one, pixel 100, pixel 200, and pixel 300. Obviously this is five volts, so I'm using five volts for this example. If we just did that, It'd be kind of messy. So this illustrates my point is just don't go and follow the rules. Think about what makes sense from the model. If we just play around with our numbers a bit and organize them so they're all in one of the veins of the spider web, it makes our wiring job much simpler. It adds one more point, but if we're just talking about one, you know, 20 inch long piece of wire, even if we're adding one more splice there, it's not going to make much of a difference for the amount of effort it saves us from going all over the spider web to do power injection. So I am bending one rule a little bit. I'm going to inject at power point one, pick, or excuse me, pixel one, pixel 108, pixel 168, pixel 240, and pixel 324. So that first to second power point, we're, we're eight over 100. It's close enough. Again, these are more guidelines. Um, they're not hard rules. So that's what I ended up doing. So here's my spider web. My spider web is very simple. Three core power in, three core data and power in, three core data and power out, and a single power injection connector. That one 14 gauge power injection connector goes along that vein and uses my, those butt splices, excuse me, those solder splices I like so much to tap off the 14 gauge to each pixel string. I'll show some more pictures of this in a second how I did this. Because what I didn't do is I didn't cut the 14 gauge, I just cut the insulation back, I cut my pixel wire and shoved it in, and then I soldered it all. Very easy, took about a minute. Let's talk about fusing real quick. Spider web is very, very, very dense. So 30% brightness is more than enough for spider web. 
use the equation again, that's about a 10 amp fuse is good. I have a single power injection run of 14 gauge cable from my box to my model, goes about 20 feet. I have zero issues with power. If I turn that brightness up to 80 or 100, it starts to brown out a bit because that 14 gauge wouldn't cut it then. But for running 30 to 50%, my spider web is good to go. Let's do a voltage check on this one. This time, 12 volts saves you nothing but four splices. If we, we'd still have to put power injection points across the spider web like this, so you just wouldn't have to cut four wires, but it would be the exact same amount of wire. Four less splices, same amount of wire, but again, we're talking about using more of a power supply. This web would have consumed a quarter of a 12 volt supply, but now we're only consuming 10% of a five volt supply, or a tenth. Again, I always, I use both voltages, I look at my model, I see what makes sense, I make the trade off and then I stick to the voltage for that model. Here's how I did my splicing. This is actually, this is pictures from my pixel grid. So you can see my 14 gauge cable on the left. I've taken an X-Acto knife and carefully cut the insulation at the different points where I'm gonna inject power and left it as one solid piece of wire. I cut my pixel wire, I strip it back, I slide my solder, sleeve, solder sleeves down the 14 gauge wire to each point, and then I shove the stripped pixel wire into the sleeve from either end, use a heat gun, zap it, and now I've made a really good soldered electrical connection. And in this case, it was along the entire base of my pixel grid. My pixel, I have two, two of these pixel grids, they're 380 pixels each. It's very similar to the 340 pixels in the spider web. Same kind of rules, one power connector, three core in, three core out, and I'm good to go. So these grids only, you know, I don't really have a lot of wire in my display. I have 14 gauge wire, but even though majority, I use five volts more than I use 12 volts, I don't have a ton of power injection wire running everywhere. I've only used maybe 200 feet total of, ooh, excuse me, my 14 gauge landscape cable. So recap, what are the rules that we learned? Both wires at every power, both positive and negative at every power injection point, Always start at pixel one. No more than 50 for five volts, 100 for 12. In either direction, up or down the string. So that really means power inject every 100 for five volts and power inject every 200 for 12 volts. Isolate power supplies, isolate fuse zones. Those, those kind of go together. You should be fusing your power supplies and, and then you just really need to isolate fuse zones because you don't want to have a fault end up drawing too much power through your pixel wire and causing it to burn up. Use good wire for power injection. 14 gauge is actually pretty cheap um, and it's reliable, it's bendable, it's stranded, it's copper. And, it's, and for people in Florida, it tolerates the sun, which is why I love it. Uh, and always, make, always check that max pixel count per run, no matter what your voltage, because you just don't want to put too much strain on a power injection point. And holy crap, it's 40 minutes in, so I think I talked too fast. But I don't have anything else. Uh, I think I'm done. So I feel like I'm about to get beat up. So do I stop recording it or? Uh, it's up to you. Um, there are th um, 31 questions in chat. Oh. So um, if you want to tackle the chat ones, you know, if you're going to give examples or explain, um, maybe we're, we'll, we can supplement it with a recording on it. So sure. I would say record and, um, and we'll see how it goes. Does someone um, feed me the questions or do I need to go through chat? Um, okay, so let me see. Um, well, 12 volt, <laughs> volt rules, uh, 5 volt for life. Mo volt is mo better. Are there any real questions? <laughs> hey, this is Pat. Can you hear me? I got one. Yep, you, you have the floor. Go right okay. ahead. Can you go back to the slide with the, the power injection about our, um, where you had 150 nodes and you injected it at 100? Yeah. This one, right? Yeah, yep. So all along, and so this is something new for me, all along, and if I would have had this, I would have injected at the beginning and at the end, thinking, well, 75 is 75 and that's good, but this actually seems to make more sense. So, so someone asked me for an advice on, on power injecting a 100 pixel snowflake. And I said, oh, that's kind of the, the easiest. You just take the end and tie it together at the beginning 
and run power both ways and you've met the 50 count rule. And, and he goes, oh, I didn't know I could do that. I'm like, yeah, just tie the positives from the beginning and the end of the string together and tie the negatives from the beginning and the end of the string together and solder that into your connector, into your snowflake, and you won't have an issue anymore. He goes, oh, that makes sense. So again, that goes back to your model. You know, things like snowflakes tend to always have the last pixel and the first pixel really close together. So that's one of those things where it's almost dead simple just to go ahead and take your two positives from the beginning of your string and the end of your string and solder them together and attach that to your pigtail for your connector going into your model. All right, yeah, that, I just never heard the 50, the 50 rule and that uh, sheds some light on things and it probably make it easier. Yeah, again, these aren't the golden rules. These aren't the rules. This is my system, so no one can tell me I'm wrong because you're, you're telling me I'm wrong with my system. And I'm telling you my system because I don't want to have to talk to you again. I love talking to you guys, <laughs> but I don't want to have you coming back going, Bill, I did this and it didn't work. So what I'm teaching you here is how to be successful with my system, not push the limits, not take it risky. I want you to be able to go build a prop in 95% to 98% of the time you plug it in, it works as intended. Okay, and then the only other question is, can you in can you power inject with a with a different power supplier? Does it have to come from the same one that you started the, the string with? That's that rule right there. You absolutely can use a separate power supply. That's the one thing you need to do though, is just along your string halfway between the power supplies is cut the positive wire. That way you don't have two power supplies feeding each other and you don't have issues with fusing, uh, not properly protecting your pixel string. Okay, but you do have to tie the negatives together. Yes. And I suggest doing it in the, the string itself. Some people will put jumpers in their enclosures and you can do that, but just go ahead and do it like the way I've wired it and it's just fine. I think those were my two questions. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Oh, thank you. I think you should actually do this one at the expo. Oh, do you? That's good to know. This is one of the ones I've considered. And bring props. Bring the, uh, <laughs> uh, the no, bring the, the, the um, spider web. That's a, mm. an awesome demo. I'm glad. And a fire extinguisher. Yeah, if we could light one up, that would be awesome too. I mean, if, if we could see the really bad part. If we could then, burn one, you know, that would be awesome. Let's just crank the that's, that's, that's where I'm going with this. Yeah. We've actually, we've, we've actually done that. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Russell's really good at burning things on purpose. Oh, yeah, man. We've actually done that. All right, guys, we're recording. So let's stick to questions until we're done recording. Um, one of the comments, Bill, uh, is that your 55 um, uh, number is at white. Um, versus right. So again, I'm teaching you how to be successful, not to push the limits. Um, if you want to go all white with your display somewhere in your sequence, I want you to be able to do all white somewhere in your sequence. Uh, for Halloween, I tend to use all white a lot because it's a nice blinding effect. So sometimes I'll, I'll start a dark period by blinding them first for my entire display or there's an impact. I want to punch real hard. I don't want to punch real hard for a split second and have a pink display. I want to punch real hard for a second and have a white display. So all these rules are about making you successful and not having issues where, well, this part, when I go white, suddenly my half my display is pink and it doesn't look good, so I'm going to have to mess with the brightness here. I don't, I don't want to set people up for having to deal with issues like that. I'm setting you up for being successful and not running into problems. I have a question. Sure. Whenever you calculate, why don't you calculate for 100%? Um, just in case you'd ever want to go up higher than your 30 or 40 or even 50%. So I left, I left, the reason I teach you the equation is because I'm going to leave that decision to you. Where, was, where is that equation? This one. Um, I'm going to, you know, if you always build your display for 100%, you, you might find that you are spending a little bit more time doing power injection or putting a lot of fuses out there. That's almost a personal choice. And I, I teach you the equation because I want you to make the decision to do that. Now, if you look at this, what happens if you design for 30%, but then went to 100%? What's gonna happen is you blow your fuse, because uh, you're gonna end up drawing too much power for your fuse, and your fuse is gonna do its job and protect you and protect the wire. So you can say, so I want you to make the decision if you wanna be capable of going to 100% or not. That's gonna, obviously that derives how you fuse, that drives how many pixels you put per string, that drives how many times you have to cut between your fuses. You can do 100% if you'd like, and some people do, and I do in some props as well. Um, but I want you to decide if you want to do 100% or not. I will say that for two years, I, I thought I was 100% across the board. It wasn't until I hit a certain pixel density in my display and added to my display to the point I went, wow, some of this stuff is too bright, and it's starting to wash with my other props. So my first year of really balancing my brightness was last year, 
and I admit the people who are telling me that you need to reduce your brightness on things, I've changed my mind, they were correct on that statement. Um, and, there, and because of that, I have designed some of my props for this previous show to account for the fact that I'd be using less of a, a brightness and to allow me to, to stretch out how many pixels I can put on a string. So I'm not saying you should, I'm not saying you should. It's completely up to you. And obviously that changes this equation a bit and, how, and figuring out how many pixels you can put behind the fuse. Does that answer the question? Yep. Thanks. And the only one other thing I had was you can't overpower inject, correct? I mean, no, I, yeah, being over cautious is not, it only costs you time and, and money on wire. Uh, there's no reason that this, this, these rules I've set you up with all, is already a, a bit over cautious. I and mean, you could probably stretch out 12 volts to 150 pixels if you want and not experience any problems. But I, again, I gave, I'm setting these, the system up to be successful. I picked numbers that I felt are comfortable with through my own testing or experience to make sure that uh, uh, new, newcomers would be uh, successful. Um, so I, 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 you know, I don't recommend being more cautious than what I presented here because the system already is kind of cautious. So are there any additional questions? I, I read through and pretty much all of the ones in chat were comments or people addressed the questions. So um, are there any questions that folks have for Bill? Yeah, I guess I have. Can you hear me? I have yeah. one question here. So uh, you made a comment this uh, power injection is all about uh, pixels. Uh, the nodes, um, and you made a, a comment about with strips, it's a little bit different rules. Could you comment on how you would handle strips differently or what we need to pay attention to? Um, so that was only about, where was the section? So I think it was here when I was talking about the differences in voltage. What I was saying is, um, so what drives this whole issue with voltage is uh, how much power the LED needs and, and, and the fact that LEDs are actually constant, I'm gonna get too involved in technical details. So there's a lot of different types of strips. You've noticed there's five volt strips that are one pixel per LED, and then there's those 12 volt strips that are three LEDs per pixel point. Right. That's where things get a little iffy. That, and there's a lot of differences in strip construction from what I've seen, and how much actual copper they put on the strip to, to send wire down. Strip's one of those things that I really have to think about what good rules I could convey to you. Um, I've had a 12 volt strip where I had to inject every 100 because if I was injecting every 200, it was too dim. Um, strips are fickle. I, mean, I, think, I think you can ask anyone about strips. Uh, you'll, you'll get a lot of different responses back because strips are very fickle. Um, they're not as standardized as the, the 12 millimeter nodes are. Okay. That's, it's one of those things where I recommend testing it. Just plug a strip in and see how far you get at the brightness you want. And then, yeah. and then figuring out, okay, if I got 70 pixels with these five volt strips, I know I need to inject every 70 pixels and that solves the problem. Yeah, so measure my voltage at all, but measure my current that's going through uh, an example set and then figure out what I got to go do with it. I mean, if you, want, if you have those tools, absolutely. Or simply just plug them in and run a white test mode and see when they go too dim or they turn too red for your liking. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, Bill, I've got a question for you. You know, sometimes you'll see someone's um, control box that they've built and they'll add one of these $3 amp meters or volt meters into their controller setup. Is that something you do or would recommend at all? And what would be the advantage or disadvantage to that? I don't. I don't have any sort of voltage measurement or current measurement in any of my controllers. I think it's for people who like industrial controls and just want to see that kind of data. Um, for me, if I plug in and it lights up and works, I'm good to go. If it doesn't light up and work, I can grab my volt meter to test it. Um, had I installed, you know, those, those panels into my control box, sure, it would have been one less step to figure out what's going on. Um, but I, you know, except for situational awareness and people that just like to uh, build things like that, I don't really see an advantage to using those meters inside your controllers. Um, especially since if you use Falcons, Falcons sense voltage for you and you can use the web page to show voltage uh, inside your control box. And when you set the voltage, it, let's say it's a five volt run, do you set it exactly a five? Or I, never actually, I never actually trim low. those. I actually just stick to whatever they came with. I buy mean wells, I buy the mean wells from Chris. Um, I've had zero issues with one coming, um, drifted too far from voltage. Um, typically those power supplies, that trimmer only trims 10% up or down at most in the output voltage, which means you, know, you can maybe be running 13 volts or 11 volts 
I found that you don't really ever have that sort of extreme um, measurement when you come in. I do know people suffered an issue a couple years back with pink pixels that would never turn off. And that was a defect with the design of 12 volt pixels back then that, would, that the only solution was to turn down the voltage below 12 volts. I can explain to anyone interested how, what that was from an engineering standpoint and what caused that problem. Um, but that was the only time anyone ever really needed to touch, I, and I believe anyone needs to touch that trimmer on your power supply. I just trust that my 5 volt supply is close enough to 5 volts that it works and 12 volts close enough to 12 volt, and I haven't had an issue since I use Meanwells. Now, have you actually tested the gauge of the wires that we get? So let's say, you know, I don't know whether you order from Ray or from whoever, but you know, when they say they're 18 gauge, do you have an opinion as to what they typically are? I've only, personally, I've only laid hands on pixels from two different vendors, um, and they didn't, uh, they, they up, were up front and said this were two different size pixels. So I've used, I've pretty much been exclusively DIY LED Express, and they only sell 18 gauge. And I bought some 20 gauge from, from Crockett, and they were clearly smaller than my 18 gauge, but they should have been because I bought pixels that were a smaller gauge. Uh, I have not, there's a lot of people that have done tests, they use calipers. Um, I'm a little leery of using calipers because it's really easy to scrunch wire and not get a good circular connection. Um, if I were to test pixels, I wouldn't measure the, I wouldn't measure, physically measure the copper at all. I'd actually measure at 100% white, what's the voltage at the end through 50 pixels. Because that'll actually give you an idea of quality, not, not only in the size of the wire itself, but its composition and consistency, if we really wanted to compare vendors. So anyone that really wants to do an analytic uh, comparison of vendors for, for performance, I wouldn't measure physically the diameter. I'd actually measure the performance. What is the voltage at the, begin at the end of the string for all the different vendors of pixels? Because that tells you a bunch of different aspects, not just physical dimensions. I have not done that myself, no. I haven't had issues with DIY LED Express. They've always been good to me, and the pixels have always been high quality. They're one of the few, they're, one of the, they're a vendor that I know when I buy 12 volt pixels from, it's a different design 12 volt than what you get from China. It's a linear regulator 12 volt. And those are the ones that are a little bit better performing than the resistor based 12 volts you get from China sometimes. Um, so I tend to stick with DIY LED just because I know I'm getting a little bit better quality than, than chancing it with China. That's my opinion. I'm not saying that's, don't take that as gospel or anything like that. That's just my opinion. Yeah, and I'll have to, I've been doing a study on wire gauge and, and Ed, to your point, I've got them from pretty much every major vendor now. And, um, and they are, they're all pretty consistent and they're all uh, not, not close to what would be standard uh, 18 gauge AWG or, or 20. Um, and I have not, and you know, Bill's got a good point as far as, and I've gauged it, not with just calipers, um, but with um, an actual wire gauge. And um, we can, we can do uh, the, the pass through, you know, I can go in there and get some measurements and pass some voltages through them. I think that's a good idea. Um, but anyway, my experience is they are all fairly consistent and they're all fairly consistently wrong. And so I think the, the 20 gauge and uh, 18 gauge are, are pretty similar, but there's, you know, most are, most are pretty overstated, I believe. Um, and they're, they're all pretty similar in between vendors from what I've experienced. 18 gauge to 18 gauge and 20 gauge to 20 gauge. And like I said, I've got, I've got some from about all of them. <clears throat> Hey, Bill. Yes. You had two different uh, connectors in there for your power injection. You had the trailer connector and the uh, new one. Um, yeah, that was, that was actually a generational thing. I started with those trailer connectors. They were just expensive because they were like almost $8 per one connector. Um, but, you know, being automotive and being out in the weather, I knew they'd always work well because they're meant to be on trailers and things like that. Um, but I just, the, the dollars were adding up for at eight dollars per connector. Uh, someone recommended those automotive, those MUI knockoff automotive connectors, and they were much better value at a dollar per connector. Um, so I, I bought a few and played with them and decided they're actually not that bad. And I've converted a lot of my show to use them, and I don't use those trailer connectors anymore. Anyway, well, I'm wondering what were you using to designate between the five and the 12 volt since you have a bi voltage system? I used a label. Um, so let's see if I can go back to the picture of my control box and I remember where that is. Oh, here you go. So the connectors are the same. I could make the mistake of plugging a 5 volt string into 12 volts, but I take a labeler. I use green for 5 volts and I use red for 12 volts. 
and I have not had an issue uh, making a mistake in plugging five volts into 12 volts because I just look at the label. You're doing your whole display by yourself, right? Uh, I have, I actually have to travel a lot during Christmas. So I have the wife keep an eye on it and fix things while I'm gone. And I have a coworker come and fix things while I'm gone. It's in okay. Dependable, dependable helpers then. Okay, good. Yeah. That's not my case, I'm afraid. Uh oh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you could you could always you know pick your own standard for different voltages if you're worried about that. Um, I've seen people use three pin connectors and and what make one and then just use different pins two in each for the type of connector. That may there is no there's never any issue about plugging in the wrong connector. I think that's pretty clever. Just make the grounds the same, but make one pin five volt, one pin twelve volt, and then you only use the pin you need for that prop. Thank you. I got a question, Bill. On that one picture of the um, one where you took an exacto knife and split it apart four times or five times? Yes. How is that not dropping the voltage as it goes down the line? It is. It is to some degree, but since it's 14 gauge, it can. So the, the thicker the wire is, the less voltage effect, voltage drop effect you'll have in the wire. Because it's all, it, you know, one of the things that, that governs how extreme the voltage drop becomes is wire composition and wire gauge. The more copper you add to the problem, the less pro problem voltage drop becomes. So by using 14 gauge cable here, that's a pretty thick connection compared to you know, our 18 or 20 gauge pixels that reduces the effect of voltage drop along the length of that power injection run. Okay, I got it. That's, that goes back to my slide about using good wire. I see people use Cat5 and twist the pairs together. I'm great that that works for them, but I would never do it just because I'm really leery of undercutting the, the, the gauge of wire I'm using to deliver power. So I stick to 14 gauge. I don't go high, I don't go lower than 14 gauge uh, just because they start getting pretty expensive for 12 and 10. Uh, but I do try to stick to 14 gauge for my power injection runs. I have a question on your, on your wiring here from pixel to pixel. Um, the bottom pixel, going into the uh, connector. It looks like you're using one connector to solder three wires. You're talking about or this picture? Right there, yes. So right here, this wire, that 14 gauge power injection wire, that's a continuous wire, ooh, excuse me, continuous wire that I've simply cut away some insulation on, like right in this picture. Uh -huh. I then took my blue wire. This blue wire was a loop between these two pixels, just like it is here. It's data. I that loop, and I cut it, and I stripped it. So now instead of it being a, loop, a continuous wire, it's now a cut wire with two bare ends. And then I just shoved the bare in each side of the, each side of the um, uh, shrink tube and soldered the whole thing down. And the blue wire here is data? Blue wire here is ground. And the, the, it's kind of hard to see with my injection wire, but it's actually the black power injection wire. A lot of the red just leaked onto it when they made the die for this particular run. So this picture only shows me injecting ground at the moment. I haven't installed the positive wire yet. And these pixels, the white is the data, the blue is the ground, and the red is the positive. Okay, that's why I was confused, because the pixels I had, the blue wire was always the data. No, I'm sorry. These pixels, the blue wire is ground. Bill, I think what he's referring to, what he's referring to is that there are some out there that the colors were changed. I've got a couple of them myself. Okay, so yeah, you, you have to adapt the, the color a bit in your, in your picture of this, but in, in my particular pixel, blue is ground. And someone asked on that picture, are you only connecting power and not ground? I, this, is a, this is an in-progress picture I haven't finished yet. The next picture shows both wires installed. Um, so you can see there's red and black going along these pixels. As you know, I can't zoom in. And you can see that the red and the, and the, the positive and the negative in each one of these injection points is taken off the strips there. Taking off my pixel run. And you can see the data is not touched. So my white data wire goes to the next pixel unimpeded. It's just the power wires that I'm cutting and stripping to create power injection points. So do you have a picture of what that prop really is? If you go back to your whole house thing, I'm just curious on what that what that grid is and what you're using it for. That's the grids right here on either side of my door. Oh, okay. Now, Bill, you mentioned that you use Meanwell power supplies. Is there something that's better about Meanwell than at cheap Chinese ones? Or, you know, is there any protection you get um, by, by utilizing them? 
I've, I've personally tested the protection of three different supplies. I've tested um, two different sets of mean wells and, one, and a, a couple of my Chinese ones. Uh, the answer is I've actually was pleasantly surprised with the Chinese ones. They did offer protection that I, I wasn't sure they'd offer protect to be able to offer. Um, and, and, and I, I was, that's up for debate. I, I think, uh, they're all, they're all okay. Just for my own peace of mind, I stick with mean wells because, you know, I, I, I like thinking I'm paying a little bit more for maybe less of a risk of fire or a little better design safety ratings in the power supplies. If I was really true to my word of being an electrical engineer, I'd probably be buying $100 UL listed CE certified power supplies instead and, and really having a guarantee that nothing bad would ever happen to them. I don't have that kind of money. Um, so I stick with the $30 mean wells. I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah, Ed, we did a similar test with three supplies. We used a Holiday Coro, a mean well, and a, a, a Amazon $15 one and had the same results as Bill. Uh, we tried different lengths of pixels and uh, we consistently set pixels on fire uh, with certain runs, month runs, and consistently uh, invoke the over, uh, invoke, invoke the protection on the power supplies on all three at the same length. And so I was like, Bill, we were pretty surprised by that, um, but they were all consistent. I still use the mean wells. I think they're built better and all that, but I've really never had a failure. And surprisingly, um, the protection kicked in on all of them at the same rate. So a question on power supply, but I've noticed on, on my power supply, and I think it's the Meanwhile power supply, when I unplug it, I get a flash in my pixels. And with the cheap China ones, I don't. With the holiday coral ones, I don't. And um, I'm wondering if, if that when I'm unplugging the power supply, if I'm doing damage to the pixel, especially that first one, when they're having that flash or that flicker as the power supply powers down. What color is the flicker? Um, usually it's white. Usually it can be pink. It can be, sometimes it's just a flash of light. I suspect, and this is just taking a shot in the dark, thinking about it, I suspect it's just a noise issue. I'd be surprised if you were having some sort of voltage spike on the power lines itself causing that to happen. I'm more thinking that may be a, a noise issue of the power supply shutting down and some of the filtering not working well, letting some high frequency noise out that's causing errant data to go to the pixel. So I would guess, no, you're not causing any damage, but if it ever does cause damage, I'd be curious to get the aspects of what your display is that caused that damage. Well, actually, uh, to jump on that same conversation, when I, when I plug in a string into my Falcon, and maybe David Pitts can jump on this, my first pixel, pixel always flashes red for a second. I mean, it doesn't matter what I plug in every single time. When you plug a string in, you're always going to get some errant data on that first pixel to cause a flash like that. So that's exciting. Okay. Hey, Bill, could you go back to the picture of your controller box where you added that little fuse block? Because I was kind of confused. It looked like you just had all black wires going into it, which would all be negative, but uh, not that one. The other one that had the fuses. Uh, okay, let me see. Uh, where was that picture? Even this one sort of too, because you got two red wires going in there, which are both positive, yeah. right? Well, uh, in this case, you caught me. I, I could have used a black wire. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just had a bunch of red wire left over okay. and used red for both voltages. And, and okay, just, so maybe that's what you did in the other one too, I'm thinking then. Yeah. Because you used, just used all black instead of red and black. I got mail. Oh, I got mail. <laughs> Sorry, I got mail. Oh, <laughs> uh, was it good mail? Uh, let's see. Where's that other power supply? I don't remember where it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so that this one. one. This one's actually kind of, well, okay, so this one, I use black wire for both positive and negative just because okay. this, that landscape wire comes in a, a pair that's glued together. And I, and it's uh, the landscape wire. It is all black because it's meant to hide your display. Okay. Is, I just want to check. Yeah. Cause I just want to make sure I wasn't missing something. <laughs> no, I was just using my landscape 14 gauge cable here for my connections and that's all black wire. So that wasn't okay. missing that time. All right. Thanks. Are there any final questions for Bill? <laughs>
Um, yep, I've gotten the shrinks, I've gotten the solder sleeves from either DIY AliExpress or Amazon. Um, couple people arguing with me. <laughs> yeah. I Russell agree with pay, someone. Russell paid me 20 bucks to argue with you. Yeah, Sorry. I'm not surprised. What? Again, <laughs> oh, another note about those solder sleeves, since there's a couple questions about how you use them. One of the other things I've seen people do wrong that causes them to fail is you're not supposed to tightly twist the wires before you enter them. You know, a lot of people have a habit of cleanly and tightly twisting the, all the strands together before inserting it into the solder sleeve. And that's exactly what you're not supposed to be doing. If you read the instructions for those solder sleeves, it says to leave the wire uh, loosely strand, loosely tightened, or loosely or loose, not tightened down. So that way the different strands can intermingle when the solder melts. So if you do use those solder sleeves, resist the urge to make them nice and neat and twist the wires tightly and neatly because you're not supposed to do that when you use those solder sleeves. You're supposed to leave them loose. Bill, someone's asking about using Cat5 wire for power injection. Do you just want to comment on that briefly? Yeah, I, I kind of did. I don't like using Cat5 wire because power injection, what you're, what, one of the aspects you're fighting with power injection is you're fighting small wire causing more voltage drop. So Cat5, I believe, is 22 or 24 gauge wire. Russell, what is Cat5, Russell? Is it 24? I think, yeah, it's 24. 24. It's, a very, it's a very thin wire. You know, you, you, even if you're twisting three together, you, you got to raise the question, what, is, what gauge is that making it effectively making it? What kind of fusing would I need for that? It's kind of hard to figure out, and I just don't recommend it. I recommend using a bigger gauge wire, something like landscape cable, and being done with it. Hey, yep. Bill. This, yep. is, uh, this is Earl. I've done the calculations on the Cat5. If you twist three together, you come out with a, approximately a number 19. Let me ask you this, though. What if a fault develops along your cable just with one of those 24 gauge wires? Poof. Right. I lost 250 feet in five seconds. But I mean, uh, people that use Cat5 get all, uh, use, they think it's great and uh, uh, more power, uh, you know, it's great that it works for you. For anyone new, I just, I, you know, my advice is to stick with something like landscape. Cable. No, it, you're, you are correct there. I mean, I've used both. And if you, you do, if you have a short, yeah, you lose a lot in a hurry. So, so you're right on that. I, I, will probably be ch using my data through the cat cable and rewiring. Okay. Now I have heard of people using cat cable for longer data runs and that's perfectly acceptable because data doesn't transfer power. You have to be a little careful with how you do ground in that case though because you don't want to uh, allow a scenario where pixel power will flow through the ground of that cat five that's bringing your data somewhere. Your fuse block in this picture, um, are those five amp fuses? Those are probably 10 amps. I tend to push all my injection points to 10 amps um, just so I, I don't have a lot of injection points. I use 10 amps over 14 gauge wire. And then in the prop itself is where all the injection points happen. And that's what keeps my display neat. Most of my props have one single power connector. That is that 14 gauge a power connector and in the prop itself there's a bunch of injection points to distribute the power evenly across all my pixels um, and you know that's kind of what I showed tonight I'm not saying you have to do it that way you can have you know two or three 18 gauge runs to each prop that's fine um, but my display is a lot neater just because I don't do that but again it's not about neat displays it's about making lights blink The X-Lights projects exist because of people like you. Help continue the project by making a donation today at xlights.org slash donate.